for inviting me tonight. Thanks for taking the time out of your very busy schedule, I'm certain, to uh, hear a couple of my ideas and experiences about what works and what doesn't when challenging authority in the most harsh way possible, at least most harsh to them. We are part of a global movement that exists as far east as Kazakhstan, South Korea, Japan, and as far east as San Francisco, as far west, sorry. Uh, we, uh, there are part of South America uh, and Australia. I sometimes say that we don't, we're not quite global, a part party on Antarctica. So, we're an embodiment of a liberties movement. This movement has many, many facets. Free Software Foundation to Electronic Frontier Foundation to fight for the future and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's all about the same basic thing, that the internet is something beautiful. It's awoken a sense of civil liberties and a sense of community we hadn't felt before. And it's that it's something more important than the old guard that it threatens. It's kind of when people learned to read and write following the printing press. That was something that was previously reserved for the clergy. But what people realized was that once you had learned how to read and write, that was not an experience that could be unlearned. In the same way, being online and sharing ideas, thoughts, sentiments, and to, to paraphrase a famous quote, I'm not entirely sure where my own mind ends and somebody else's starts. And being part of that is something I cannot unlearn. So we are part of the embodiment of that. And there is an old guard fighting back very ferociously and voraciously trying to prevent essentially their own unseating. Now, how do you go about taking their jobs? Because that, that's what this is about, right? We are realizing that they're doing a shit job, so we're going to take it away from them. That also happens to be one of the quickest, way to, quickest ways to bring about change. If you're just doing activism, Odds are that most people in office will say, oh, that's a nice rally. I'm sure they had a permit. Now what's on the agenda for today? However, if you're threatening their job in the next election, they're going to care a whole lot more. There's a saying. There's a saying that a career politician's first policy goal is to get elected. A career politician's second policy goal is to get re-elected. And whatever comes third is so far behind, it never has any impact whatsoever on policy matters. And now this is my, a bit sarcastically, but it's not a, without a grain of truth to it. And you, this is a weakness. This is their Achilles heel, and this is what you can use against them. Because if you threaten their ability to get reelected, that is where it hurts. That, means you, that also means you can affect policy changes even without getting a single seat in office. But we are getting seats in office, and I, I'm going to give you a bit of pointers to that. So getting support, getting popular support, getting a popular support for a brand. A lot of people support the liberty in a speech. A lot of people support the internet as it is. A lot of people hate Comcast. <laughs> but going from there to supporting a new brand, a new symbol, a new name, the Pirate Party, is a selling point. And if I'm being... Um, a bit cynical, it's not that different from selling any commercial brand, as in you're selling an identity. 
Yes, I'm a pirate. And for these values, that means I'm standing up for A, B, C, D, and not Comcast. So we are... A key part to succeeding is establishing this identity. And being online is not enough to do that. I'm not sure if you've seen my book Swarmwise. In, uh, in that book, I detail how to build a movement at scale and be visible also on the streets. You can see the uh, US parties on the streets all the time. And what that does is that it kind of breaks this only a website notion and it actually makes people connect in the streets on their way to work on their way to do coffee and whatever it be a lot of people out there you just have to be visible and in this it is absolutely key to have a unique selling point this again it marks this is marketing speak again. I am an entrepreneur. I come from that point. So it can be translated into many different contexts. But you need to stand for something that others don't. In essence, there needs to be a reason to pick you. Just like, there, just like Nike is fighting with this, it, there needs to be a reason to pick Nike over other shoe brands. Or there needs to be a reason to pick Kellogg's over other brands of cereal. There needs to be a very specific, consistent, and strong reason to pick the Pirate Party. Uh, we, we've seen in many countries how easy it is to become the discontention party. As in, just, there's some that is not all of the others. That is not really a unique selling point. Yes, you can get votes on it. But in particular, happen, happened in Germany and might be happening in Iceland right now. But what happens next is that you have a very hard time sustaining that. Because if you don't have a clear sense of identity other than not being the others, surviving that onslaught of support is much harder than gaining it. And gaining it is hard. So have this very, very clear identity. Keep a clear identity. And I'll return to when people take offense with that identity. That is not a problem, but I'll return to that. In this, it's totally okay to be bold. It's totally okay, compatible to have one long-term vision on one hand and short-term policies that are small steps toward that vision on the other hand. For instance, we can quite say that we envision a world of permissionless sharing, permissionless creativity, and permissionless innovation. In this, patents and copyright monopolies are government, uh, government mandated private monopolies that stand in the way of prosperity. So in the long term, we, we see them as obstacles to development. That's the vision. On the other hand, you can totally combine it with a short-term vision. that These are the concrete policy steps we see for the next term of office that start walking in the direction we want. It took, a, it took many parties a long time to combine these. So what do we want to do with the copyright monopoly? Do we want to abolish it? Do we want to reduce it to this scope? This scope, that's... It's totally compatible to have a long-term vision for where you want to go. What does your ideal society look like? And short-term goals. And in that, it is very important to be values-driven rather than... Driven. I sometimes talk about analog equivalent rights, as in one of the greatest failures of our generation is that we are not passing on the civil liberties of our parents to our children. Our parents had the right to send a private message. They had the right to read the news anonymously. They had the right to read an article without somebody holding a stopwatch, looking at how long they read every article, in what order, and what they paid attention to. The list goes on. And this 
I feel is one of the greatest failures of of my generation. And I feel it's getting paramount to safeguard that our children actually have those civil liberties. At present, we're letting a cartoon industry regulate the internet. And that is cause for concern. So if you're driven by values and not by issues, it becomes much easier to deal with new phenomena like Uber and Airbnb and things that were 15 years ago when the <laughs> grandiously named DMCA was written, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. I don't think people predicted that the internet would threaten the taxi business. But if you keep civil liberties in mind, if you keep in mind that a minimum goal should be that the next generation inherit a greater set of civil liberties than that of their parents, for instance, then you have a guiding star that's going to take it through any and all issues. One example of such a value is permissionless everything. We're seeing permissionless sharing, permissionless creativity, permissionless in guiding stars in what some call the new economy and what I would like to call a new, well, almost a new. Some people say that the internet is the biggest invention since the printing press 500 years ago. Others say it's the biggest invention since the written language 6,000 years ago. And I'm not sure which it is, but it is on that scale. So when you're talking about these ideas, when you're talking about civil liberties, and when you're talking, they don't give a shit about what the cartoon industry thinks about the internet, because we don't let them regulate the power grid or the road network, and we're not going to let them in, in, regulate the internet either. It's not about, you are going to get pushback, you get ferocious pushback. The more important, the more influential you get, the, the harsher people are going to attack you on a personal character and moral level in ways you are not prepared for. You might think you are, but you are not. And in this, it is very important to remember that it's not about how many don't like you. How many don't like you. It's, how many, it's about how many do like you. And if they like you enough to make that identity determine their vote. So key here, absolutely key for the modus operandi of a political party. Much more important to have a small devoted following than a large number of May supporters, just being overall lukewarm and not liked or disliked by anybody. It's much better to be hated by 75% of the population because that means they talk about you all the time and drive the remaining quarter of your arms and, give, and make them give the vote to you. And now you return to numbers there. So don't fear pushback. Don't fear people saying you suck or that you're monsters or whatever. That's a sign of success. So finally, let, let's look at numbers after these 15 minutes. The Empire Party was founded in a proportional system environment where if you took 5% votes nationwide, you got 5% of the seats. Uh, just like in the US with, a, with Team Red and Team Blue, for some reason most countries have a Team Red and Team Blue, what, what's in those colors vary wildly. Most countries have Team Red and Blue tied for power by just a percent unit in every election, meaning take a wedge of 5% in between those two blocks, you get to be the kingmaker. You get to be the tiebreaker. Both blocks need you for a majority support and a majority government. That means you get to sit down and play who wants to be a prime minister, which is a very powerful position to be in. Now, the U.S. is not like that. In the U.S., you need a majority in a given area to get a single seat. France is also like that. The UK, that a couple of other countries are also like that. But it changes the game slightly. 
However, what is going to work in the U.S. Pirate Party's favor, or I, su- I should say in the Massachusetts Pirate Party, but in such an, such an environment, is the low voter turnout. In the last midterm congressional elections in the U.S. was 36.4%. 36.4%. And you probably saw all the polls about how people were voting 49 points versus 51 points, blah, 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 blah. Now, remember, those were only among the votes cast. If the actual results had been tallied, you would probably see something like candidate A, 19 points. Candidate B, 17 points. Therefore, candidate A wins. The rest are non-voters. And those tend to flock to us. Those tend to flock to us. I've had people come up to me say, Rick, I many years, you've finally given me something to believe in. Thank you. So we're not really competing with the entrenched political identities here. Rather, we are an identity for the people who today are politically homeless. We're a stake in the ground to to rally to. We're a serious alternative for those who are up with crony corruption, with safeguarding the old at expense of the next generation, and for those who desperately seek to see the, the, the values of the next generation represented in policymaking. Those people don't have an alternative today in that. And importantly, The numbers do say we can win, even in a first-past-the-post system. On Iceland, we are polling at 25%, even 29% in some polls. Taking 29% of the eligible vote, of the eligible vote, you're winning by a landslide, even in the United States. We can do this. We can totally do this. It's going to be hard work. It's going to be very much emotionally uphill sometimes when you're being violently attacked, rather emotionally attacked. It's it's going to feel like violence. And at the end of the day, though, the feeling of an election victory dinner is the experience of a lifetime. And I cannot hope more that you get to experience that. And I do believe you can. So I'll be hanging around for a bunch uh, for conversation and casual chat if you have any uh, questions in general. For um, hey, Ray, I know you. Hey, how are you doing? It's Lucia. How are, How are you? How are you? Oh, great to see, great to see you, Lucia. Can you see me? I, I'm fine. <laughs> I, don't I can even see know. you. I, I, I'm looking at you. Yeah. Hey. From, hey. How are you doing? Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Oh, uh, I, I do hope I, I contributed something that was at least of some value after the, after this discussion. I mean, it's a heavy subject. It is. But, but, This is, in my experience, where what most people are not prepared for as they started to grow. Um, I just wanted to point out to the people here that I did read Swarm Wise as it was being released. Uh, You can just read it on your phone because you released it chapter by chapter. It's a good book. I recommend it. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm torn. So I'm going to tell you what's on my mind and I'll let you decide what you want to respond to. Uh, You know, when we talk about the pushback, I think about the, um, Peter Sund and his uh, talk about the pirate movement being dead and people abandoning Pirate Parties International. I hate to bring up these negative things, but I can't help but think that somehow on some level it's pushback coming 
from some nefarious place. And then, of course, the other thing that was on my mind is um, John Deere adding DRM to their vehicles and right. start thinking about the coffee makers having DRM. And it's like, can the peasants own anything? How medieval <laughs> are we becoming? So I'm going to leave it to you what you want to talk about. What What is most pressing to you? Pushback or... Fair enough. So there are, a couple, there are a couple of very interesting issues there. One, one is, yeah, we, we are going to have disillusioned people, even from within our own group or people we considered colleagues. And frankly, that's okay. We are not a homogenous group, and we do not aspire to be. We are, our strength lies in our collective intelligence and, and that everybody has but different ideas, that means that all ideas are tried and those who succeed kind of make it to the next round. And so they mutate and, and so on and, and things continue. Peter has had kind of a rough time. Nobody could, I mean, he, he's, he's not quite been to hell and back, but he, he's, he's had a rough time. So I don't blame him at all for just wanting to, frankly, have a bit of a life for a couple of years. I have to say the pirates did stand behind him, though, during his troubles, for the most part. Absolutely. And the one for all, all for one uh, attitude is important. Um, I would definitely not agree with, the, with his idea that the pirate movement is dead. But do remember that the Pirate Movement, as a concept, did not exist before the Pirate Party. Before then, there was the Pirate Bureau, which was a think tank, and the Pirate Bay, which Peter was a part of. And Christian, uh, Christian Engstrom, who was a member of the European Parliament, worded it like this, that if you feel you need to take a break from activism, that's always the right thing to do. You, do, you never need to worry about the world running out of evil while you're away. <laughs> so it's, it's much better to take a break and come back refreshed or rather than to burn out permanently and just become a, for a former shell of an activist. <laughs> And second, about DRM and John Deere. I, I think that's very interesting because people are describing DRM in cars as an unintended side effect uh, of uh, the copyright monopoly. It is not an unintended side effect. It was the very purpose, and this is where the, the nature of property comes in. The DMCA was specifically constructed, and this goes for InfoSauce Directive in the European Union as well, which is, a mirror, which is a carbon copy. The DMCA was specifically constructed to deny people the right to modify their own product. Because that was the only way the cartoon industry could get away with a technically dysfunctional idea of DRM. That people are not to modify their cars is not an unintended side effect. It was the specific core intent of the DMCA. The copyright industry just didn't see it applying to other property than VCR players or digital media players. Now that this is spreading outside of geek toys, it's actually possible that if you can tie it back that, no, this is not a side effect. This is exactly what's been happening to the internet as a whole. Then you can find, then you can maybe, just maybe, wake policymakers up to the fact to... Remember, policymakers do not understand the internet. And it's more dangerous than that. They think they understand the internet because they're listening to old industry lobbyists about how it works. That makes them more dangerous than not understand. That actually gives them negative knowledge. 
to give uh, I mean, I worked in the European prison, but I was that suited me well because that mean, meant I could pretty much walk wh wherever I found something interesting. And I'm not exaggerating when I'm saying that policymakers are getting their e printed for them by their secretaries and therefore think they understand the internet. Now, arguably, this is mostly senior people who are in this position. But then again, those senior people are the ones pulling the strings. So, it was a pretty exhaustive answer to John Deere and <laughs> getting, get it and feeling um, a bit disheartened when you see people just drop out and. I don't know, denounce something like that, people who have been part of it. Well, I mean, we, we're constantly evolving. Is there a part of movement and who defines it? Nobody gets to define it. And, and ironically, that's part of what defines it, that nobody gets to own the label, right? I have to say that with adolescence comes a lot of drama. So maybe we're in our adolescence now. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, Thank you very we are, much. We're up for a lot. Anybody else? Oh, here we go. Hello, my name is my name is uh, Joseph. And Good to meet you, Joseph. Yep, yeah, you too. And uh, I just want to say uh, it uh, regarding the the activism portion uh, that we're doing here. Like, it's one thing to you know go in the streets, rally on the internet, say you know stop SOPA, stop uh, CISPA, stop you know whatever new. Uh, mm -hmm malevolent tr deal they're cooking up in Congress, but like that does get exhausting after you do it for the 20th time. It does. Time. So, it does. Uh, do you have any ideas of what some better permanent change, or if not permanent, then long-term solutions to uh, fixing this would be? You're part of it. <laughs> so yeah, I agree completely. I mean, I saw this in the fight against software patent monopolies in the European Union, where a, an organization called FFII, Foundation for Free Information Infrastructure, rose to prominence. And there were a lot of people burning out, some permanently in that fight. Now, we did win in Europe. Software patent monopolies did not get legalized. Unfortunately, the European Patent Office got a free reign instead, so they went ahead and awarded patent monopolies to whatever they liked. But we did win that specific fight, and while we won that specific fight, we lost 11 under the radar. We lost 11 under the radar, and that's what single time. That's why activism may work as a short-term goal, but it does not work long term. To work long term, you need. Actually, let's put it this way. When new values appear in society, they take hold in policymaking in three ways. The first wave is that existing policymakers pick up that there's something they don't know about. They have a blind spot, so they learn about the issue. If that fails, then new policymakers in the existing organizations, the existing political parties, replace the old ones in internal elections. If that failed too, at an end, then new political organizations are being formed to carry understanding of those values into the legislative chambers on their own. And that's where we come in. We're essentially the third line of defense here. Did that, did that answer your question, Joseph? Hello. Uh, yes, I suppose you did answer it in some capacity. Thank you. Hi, how are you doing? I have a Good question. Good to meet you, Kendra. Uh, nice meeting you. Hi question about um, the Pirate Party International's 
opinion on police militarization, particularly, obviously, we have an issue here in the United States and brown black communities, but mm -hmm. how, how does a international pirate party view uh, these problems? Because it's not specific to the United States. It happens in various forms throughout the world. Um, it just seems to have been flaring up lately here. And I just right. curious in how, yeah. how, how, how internationally, uh, internationally it's being approached. It's being approached. Kennedy, did you watch Battlestar Galactica? Yes, I'm old enough to remember Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I did not ask about your age. I specifically did not ask about your age. <laughs> but yes, I, I, saw, I saw Battlestar the first time. For, okay. <laughs> I learned about the first time far after the, the, the remake. But the... Um, First, Pirate Party is international. I think that was putting the um, cart before the horse at this time. PPI started out in 20... ...get-together network where... Part, ...where essentially felt part of national leadership of the Pirate Party without appointing anybody, could just go and hang out and meet like-minded people. So it was a way of getting to grow the community. It was a way of getting to share experiences, getting to pick people's brain about how to troubleshoot issues. In 2010, something happened where people saw it fit to create a very formal organization without resource that was voting on issues. And to be honest, I'm, I didn't entirely see the as in PPI can't really have a policy because it doesn't override any national party. The one value PPI does have, and I really believe that does bring value, is bringing, uh, bringing people from the movement together every once in a while. As for deciding body, I, I'm questioning that at this stage. But police militarization, and going back to Battlestar Galactica, There was, um, we're very much about civil liberties. We're, on, we're about understanding society at its roots. We're about understanding checks and balances. We're about understanding how you construct a system to govern a country built of imperfect people and corruptible people. Because everybody is corruptible. And you have to, and you have to work with that. Commander Dama had a quote on Battlestar Galactica. It was one of the first, it was part of the first season. I don't remember exactly which episode, but paraphrasing it from memory, it was something like this. The reason we separate the military and the police. The police exists to protect and serve the public. The military exists to fight the enemies of the state. When the police or the military becomes both, the enemies of the state tend to become the public. And I think that's a very good reason to keep the two far apart. Okay, thank you. Unlike the previous person, I think the tactics are what we need to work on. So we'll be talking Fair about enough. that at, during the strategy portion of the evening, but thanks just the same. Fair enough. Uh, I've written a lot about tactics as in day-to-day -day operations in my book, Swarmwise. I was outlining kind of more soft issues and strategies for, for the long-term 15 minutes, uh, as in Gandhi was really right, you know, when he said that first they ignore you, but you, then they fight you, and then you win. <laughs> Going from being an unknown to being a laughing stock doesn't feel like going forward. <laughs> and it's important to realize that it is. You have to let your rational understanding of this process override your feelings at that point. Because it really works like that. It really progresses from being unknown to being a laughing stock. 
and then being fought on your own turf, at which point you're on well on your way to winning. So it's more like I brought up those kinds of... So a lot of people I've seen work out the tactical details. I wanted to share today with you hit a tripwire and sort of prepare you a little bit in ahead, ahead for that. Hey there, Rick. Uh, my name is Hallie. I'm just curious. Good to meet you, Hallie. Um, what you're working on for like the the TPP issue and this fast track and these agreements, especially from like your your side of the Atlantic, because um, I feel like that's not really an issue here, or it's just not in the media at all in the states. Mm. Like I barely know about it, and um, I just wonder, like, is there a way we can collaborate across seas, like? being pirates that we are, or or just like what kind of um, actions you're doing in Sweden and Europe, like do, are people talking about this issue, like do people care, and just any advice for like, yeah, or any collaboration stuff, I don't know, just, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough, there are two different questions there. First is, you're saying that mainstream media is not writing about the TPP, and that's right. Mainstream media, media as I like to call it, is this is actually quite pathetic, to be honest, keep asking themselves, why are we not appealing to young readers? Why are we losing an entire generation? And then they are writing about what they think the next generation cares about, which is Kim Kardashian, which is the most rigid, shallow issues they can lay their hands on. Not understanding that the next generation cares more about and the society we live in than any generation before it. And they're not content sitting down. They are talking about it. The next generation is more civically involved than any generation before it. So old media is completely blindsided to this. So why are they not writing about the TPP? Because it's a complex subject and Kim Kardashian's new hairdo is more accessible. <laughs> but there are many alternative media, if you like, new media, if you like, social media, if you like, where this is a hot topic. If you go to Red, a week goes by without something really serious about TPP or TTIP. And if you're fronting Reddit, you're easily getting a quarter million reads on an article. I know since my blog, when I maintained it, I've been neglecting it for far too long, was fronting Reddit on pretty much a regular basis. So, I'm well aware of those numbers. And when you're getting a reach of a quarter million people for a message or for an idea, things do have an impact. Things definitely do have an impact. So I wouldn't worry so much about what old media writes because there we're, we need to be in this for the long game. Pol policy making is a long game and old media is well, their, their influence is declining. If you influence, look at whose influence is increasing, and you'll find sites like Reddit, and for some reason, it, specific to the U.S., comedians are taking over news reporting. <laughs> and this is very U.S.-specific, where you're, you're laughing at news anchors and nodding seriously at comedians. <laughs> Like John Oliver, I mean, he did a great job on Network Valley, which I think single-handedly swayed the FCC. That and the millions of people who called following following his his call to call. So, look at emerging media to see to see what they are. Second, the issue at hand, the short term. What do we do about TPP? What do we do about TTIP? You'll notice that there are two acronyms here we're using. TPP is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It is an agreement between uh, the U.S. and a number of Asian countries across the Pacific. So Europe is not part of that. Europe is, Europe is part of the TTIP, the Trans... What is that? <laughs> Transatlantic Trade... Transatlantic something. 
Doesn't matter. It's the same shit. <laughs> The, the difference is only the parties. But the U.S. learned something when Europe voted down ACTA. And we were instrumental in doing that, by the way. That's something people can never take away from us. We were instrumental in defeating ACTA globally. And the way we did that was to deny ACTA consent in the European Parliament. The Europe, is, Europe is still the world's largest economy. If you're looking at the European Union on par with the United States, the European Union is slightly larger. Is that no global trade agreement happens without Europe agreeing to it. Which meant that if ACTA failed in Europe, it failed globally. I think that's why the US trade United States trade USTR are now taking the, uh, the route of circumventing Europe and TPP, establishing a multilateral agreement to try to raise the bar for industrial protectionism, IP, in order to, to put pressure on, on the next layer of whoever is going to sign these treaties. So TTIP then in Europe, what ha what's happening with that? Essentially, it's dead. You don't see it yet, but... Politicians are very enthusiastic. Yes, we're going to have this free trade agreement with the United States. And you're only starting to see all of these signs like, it, this, is, this is going great, but we, yeah, I, I think we might need another year. <laughs> and Germany's going out and saying that, yeah, TTIP is interesting, but this and this and this is a deal breaker. It's out or it's not, or we're not signing. And I mean, we saw all of that before with ACTA, and it's essentially a death spiral. So TTIP is going the right way. It is meaning it's dying. It is not yet dead. Pressure needs to be kept up. And if you can get that can spill over onto TPP in the United States, because that was exactly what happened when we won against SOPA and PIPA in US Congress. You all remember that one, early 2012. I mean, when, when Google, when fucking Google posts a telephone number on their homepage saying, call this number, <laughs> things happen quickly. And I mean, Wikipedia, uh, you'll, you remember this blackout day. Uh, I don't remember the exact date, but it was early 2012, sometime January 20, 2012. Well, just a week after that. The thing is, after SOPA had fallen in the United States, there were millions of people still engaged on these issues who discovered ACT out of nowhere, seeing the exact same shit is about to go down in Europe. Well, not the exact same thing, but bad enough. So all of this activism from SOPA, once we'd won that fight, spilled over onto ACTA. And I'm hopeful the exact same thing can happen with TTIP and TPP. It's, it's just the same thing all over again, after all. And if you want a telling story about this, I saw that a tweet just passed by my information flow the other, uh, I think it was yesterday, saying that a reporter writing how it's hilariously difficult to find somebody who defends the TPP who is not paid to defend the TPP. <laughs> and so, uh, so I can, I can kind of see how no, I kind of lost track there, but I was, I was pretty much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Rick. I'm Jason. Nice to meet you. To meet you, Jason. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I have, uh, I've been able to fortunately recruit a handful of people to join the Massachusetts Pirates over the year, but a few of them are anarchists. And while they love the pirate planks and uh, our position, especially the permissionless society, I still can't uh, get them to vote. Do you have 
any <laughs> any advice for how the hell I can get an anarchist to fucking vote? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, that's part of the thing, right? If you're against a government, you're not going to vote. Because... Among anarchists, that no matter who you vote for, the government still wins the election. But, and this is important, that doesn't mean they can't be useful anyway. If you have people in the community that want to engage on the issues, want to engage civically, they just don't want to vote and maybe not persuade other people, still talk about these issues. The most important, and I really cannot stress this enough. The most important key to winning is getting people talking about the issues. And even if they vote personally, they can still have a really deep felt passion for civil liberties. And some anarchists definitely fit that description. Yes, thank you. That's a great point. They provide uh, lots of places for people to meet and talk, so they provide you know, collectives and stuff like that. So, yes, thank you. I, I try to, um, I promote the idea of adopt an anarchist who, if everybody finds an anarchist friend and drives them and, you know, begs them and buys them tea or whatever to go ahead and, because if you don't vote, you're, the corporations win effectively. So. You know, anyway, um, my question is around, oh, I'm Tara Fredericks, and um, I'm from past Mass Amendment, and we are talking about amending the state constitution of Massachusetts and using our municipal rights and our home rule states' rights to amend our state constitution. State corporations are not people who mm -hmm. use speech in engaging in right. their action. So that aside, uh, we are also promoting, well, I shouldn't say this, a few of us in the group, we haven't voted on it yet, uh, a few of us in the group are promoting the TPP free zones where you adopt mm -hmm. an ordinance. It's written out in alliancefordemocracy.org and it effectively declares the TPP illegal. So if enough towns do that and you do it in a binding fashion, it's not just a non-binding resolution so you feel good, it's actual law. Um, they've done this also with the NDAA, the NDAA free zones, so you can find that language. Now, to my question. To promote something like that on a nationwide basis is very difficult, but even on a statewide basis, I know that it is difficult. But uh, something that my friend called me from LA, and he said that this group, and we never, I never found out what the group was, but they decided to put pink arrows in, in the intersections. And so these pink arrows popped up one morning, and then there was more pink arrows and more pink arrows. And before long, ABC News was covering the pink arrows. Who knows what the pink arrows are for? We don't know, Bill. I don't know. Do you know what's for? So they kept on talking about the pink arrows. And so when it really came out, it was about some women's rights group. Um, but the point was is that they had this suspended... Did I do that? Right. They had this suspended... Um, anyway, it was very exciting about uh, not manipulating the media, but manipulating this... Kim Kardashian factor where people are so thrilled with the mystery or something like that. And so I feel like we're in a position to be able to do that because, you know, adbusters or people that do internet work um, are capable of kind of creating that mystery and doing it in a way that could be around something like the uh, anti-NDAA or anti-TPP zone type ordinances. So capturing or leveraging our rights at the municipal level, which is in our grasp because you know, of five city council members is much easier than trying to get 10,000 people or even a million people to go to Washington and do anything. Right. Yeah, you do. Yeah. All right, see? So anyway, so if you could comment on what you can do um, uh, on, a, on, a, on a global basis with the network of pirates to help promote such a thing, an action in Massachusetts perhaps to incite some kind of ordinance action or something like that. Thank you. Sure, yeah. and it's a inter very interesting point. Uh, first, it's creating law does have value. It protects civil liberties does have value. But it's also important to recognize that the system is shock full of checks and balances. A law is only as valid as the people who interpret it and the people who enforce it. Or I should say, the opinions of those people. Case in point, Patriot Act Section 215. 
which the executive has used as excuse, Frank. Bulk wiretap the entire world without warrant. Which was not the intention at all, but it was something that could be sort of twisted to mean this and therefore fit a very specific purpose. Second, as for how you go about creating that mystery, you can totally do that. And you can hold media work for you here because they love that. And feeding them small snippets of information at a time, kind of working with them to create a mystery to their readers because they are all about ad revenue. They want to they want to create a story, preferably a story that works out over longer time than than just one clip. I'm st- I, I mean I can still s- see the smugness on my face when Swedish national television two weeks ahead of of the Swedish election said as the first news item on the national news that. After days of speculation, the newscast program can report today that the power taking over hosting for WikiLeaks. I had totally fed them that story. I had spoon fed them that fucking story. And they, they made it into a mystery and they were proud to present the solution that I had told them. So you can you can ideologic work in our in your favor here. Just understand that they want to pro- what they want to provide to their readers and viewers. And if you can provide if you can give them what they want to provide, then they will happily accept it. But I just want to clarify something because I don't see the law as the end game. I see as creating law as a direct action. Like for example, right. at Occupy Boston at Dewey Square, I would spread rumors of what the law were, and it, and it would go really fast. And so the cops were actually citing the law that I told them it was yesterday. Yeah, it works really well. <laughs> that is awesome. No, no, that so is you, great. So you say you're going to create a law, and you get the politicians in a room and the activist groups, and start to create the language. The language starts to spread, so it's almost law before it's even enacted. And so that's all I'm suggesting is that we can do that. That is, that is actually a very, very good suggestion. And I would like to emphasize what you're saying about language. Fr- framing things is about the side that wins, wins the long-term war. You might have noticed how I consistently say the copyright monopoly. And I, in passing, I said about laws that regulate industrial protectionism, IP. If you're in every single sentence, if you're using the language of your opponents, you're losing because you're adopting their worldview. If you're calling out these monopolies for what they are, industrial protectionism, and doing so consistently, then you're asserting a worldview which is incompatible with the old world and that is exactly how you win long term so creating language for for new laws in that language spread is absolutely essential i could not agree more Hi, Rick. My name is Jamie. Uh, I actually read your book. Okay. Up to here. Did you like it? Yeah. And I shared it with some friends in a different act. Oh, that makes me happy. Yep. Uh, I sent them the PDF with my highlights on it. And uh, something really good in there was, um, like, if you see something you don't like, do something better. Better? Yeah. Um, so... Absolutely paramount. So I have an idea, which is theoretical, but it sort of clashes with the permissionless sharing. Mm -hmm. Because are you familiar with copyleft um, or share alike or GPL? Yeah, there there are many there are many forms of it. I mean, 
if you're talking about the GPL or the uh, fair GPL or the lesser GPL and all, all of those which originate with the Free Software Foundation, then sure. Okay, so just for those who don't know, it means like uh, you have this, I think it's open source invention and then anybody else can use it and modify it, remix it, so long as it's under the same license. So, yep, so essentially the license becomes contagious. If you're, you're, you're free to reuse anything, but if you're distributing it, then it must be under the same terms as the original from or derived from and so on. And that way, it's kind of like a uh, Creative Commons share alike. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was just thinking that could be a way to, um, to like bypass and uh, intellectual property claims and even make them obsolete if you could only um, like collaboratively develop an alternative. Like, for example, there's, a, there's DRM in seeds now. How often do you hear about the Monsanto seeds? Do you hear about that? They're patented seeds. Well, since I'm following Reddit, I'm reading about Monsanto at least once a week. Yeah. But, <laughs> and, but yes, there is a lot of industrial protectionism is, is taking a lot of um, is coming into a lot of fields that people don't really see because it, it doesn't affect them in their everyday lives. But in term, I don't see, I, I still see this as a restriction. As in, if you're free to use something for non-commercial use, what's the harm if you're making money off of it? If you're a successful entrepreneur and contributed to the economy, is that really so bad? So long, I mean, I mean, there's a, uh, again, there's a difference here. Long-term vision, where do you want to go? What's your utopia, if you like? And what's the tactical steps towards walking there? And might, it might be a little bit here and a little bit there and sort of taking a scenic route as tactical opportunities op open and close. So share-alike licenses are or Creative Commons and, and GPL have been tremendously instrumental in making people aware that they have to be all restricted. But I don't think they're the end game. But you think they're a valuable stepping stone to get there? That's, uh, that, that's exactly what I'm saying, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm, I'm Eli. Good to meet you, Eli. Um, I, I just downloaded your book actually like a minute ago. I plan to start reading it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, um, so uh, I just had a question. Had a question and sure. And I forgot it. I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> this always happens. Um, It'll come to me. It'll come to else. Fair enough. If it, if it come back, comes back to just my name on any website it. or any any Twitter, that's e an advantage of having a globally unique name. I'll see it. E Eli's one of our new pirates, and he's 15, too. I just have to add that. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Most welcome to the team. All right, thanks. Can I ask a question about encryption? Sure. Uh, do you use Wicker, and do you have an opinion of it and approve? I do not use Wicker. Uh, I do use uh, old school tools like PGP yeah. Yeah. And, and Tor, frankly. Okay. So I, I tend to go with the, the old and tried because cryptography is hard, and the old, you cannot really prove cryptography right. What you can do is sort of develop a confidence over years and decades as things seem to work. I mean, in, 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 our, in this part of the world, these parts of the world, it is a civil liberties issue. In other parts of the world, it is literally a survival skill. Uh, I spoke to Jake Applebaum of the Tor Project and um, I think it was a, a presentation. Uh, a presentation he that he said that they had tried teacher 
were the ones taught using Tor. So I'm saying a survival skill with the utmost level of literalness here. I have a, a crypt, encryption follow-up question. Um, sure. <clears throat> I did some time in uh, security world. And one of the things that I feel is most important for people to understand is that in terms of resilience, terms of resilience to be as mm -hmm. agile, agile as possible, moving your stuff all around, not ever having anything in one place so that nobody has, there's no single target of information. Like the WikiLeaks, I was thinking, God, you know, they could have a you know, mirrored situation where it's just traveling all over the place. That I feel like people spend way too much time trying to encrypt one location when they should have yep. all their shit all over the place and nobody can find it and piles of crap all over the place. So anyway, thanks. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, there are, there are three important points to that. The first is that you have two very conflicting uh, goals when it comes to encrypting data. It is that you need data loss and data leak. And the actions you do to prevent against data loss are ones that increase the risk of data leak and vice versa. But in both, both cases can be catastrophic. You always do defense in depth. As in one solution is not enough. You need to have multiple layers of protection because one can fail and one will fail. Third is uh, that un an understanding of the field of information hygiene, information hygiene, another one of these words, new words, is getting, in sorry, increasingly paramount, as in, when I send this piece of data to that destination, who can see it and why? Most people don't think about that, and that's a problem. I see we're coming up on the... Here, actually, we it's are like a coming up on the end, but one more quick question, and then before you take off, we want to take a picture and have you in it somehow. Sure, absolutely, I'd love to. Okay, great. So okay, come on up. Hi, I remember my question. So, oh, great. Uh, I I know what we were uh, what we were talking about earlier with the um, Pirate Party International and mm -hmm. that whole issue, especially mm -hmm. recently. Um, I've read a few articles that have been linked to on Reddit, but. I don't know the entire background about what's what's going on with all that. So could you just could you explain a bit of background for the PPI? Uh, yeah. Thanks. So so essentially, we were a bunch of people meeting in Vienna in 2007. Uh, people who ha who were either leading nascent parties in their respective countries or wanted to start parties. We were maybe. I think two dozen people, something like that. It was organized by a, a very artsy group. And for some reason, we started to call this Pirate Parties International because it sounded cool and big. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it started out, right? It, w it was just a moniker to meet under for, for uh, catching up and sharing experiences and so on. Then it was formally founded as a big organization with bylaws and statutes and members and voting rights and as an umbrella organization. And I feel that it is buckling under its own weight at this. So what a bit was a bit putting the cart be before the horse. The national parties are not yet at a point where the national parties are able to support an international umbrella. However, meeting internationally has an immense value, but you don't need a legal entity and voting to do that. All right, well, Rick, so this is uh, James O'Keefe. Uh, I want to thank you very much for, uh, I guess I should look this way and not at the screen, this <laughs> diagonal thing. Uh, and so I want to thank you very much for uh, speaking with us. We had a Great time uh, talking totally with you. Totally my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity and, uh, to, to chat about